but we will be taking questions and answers for the last, say, 15 minutes. So that's my uh, bit of introductions. Uh, so um, just to do a very brief introduction, because really it's uh, Pat and Kira who will be doing the, the main presentation, just to mention that the Paper Contribution Contribution Studio was established by Dr. Patrick McBride in 1985 and based in Grand Canal Dock. And uh, Kira McQuirns, who is ex IADT, which brings in a John Leary link, a uh, conservator, she uh, started at the studio in 2005 and then rejoined in 2014. The studio specialises in the preservation, conservation and restoration of works of art on paper. And I know Pat and Kira are going to expand more on that range of uh, works that they uh, work on. Uh, their clients range from state institutions, museums, galleries and auction houses to private clients with a much cherished piece they feel needs attention. So, um, Without further ado, I would like to hand over to uh, Pat and Kira. So, thanks, Pat and Kira, for joining us. Hello. Good morning. Hello. Yep, we can hear you. Good morning, all. Um, can I welcome you all to the Paper Conservation Studio? And it's a delight to be able to host this vi this trip or this visit. Um, um, for you all uh, here in the studio. I see there's about 50 people online. There's no way we'll be able to fit 50 people into the studio for a regular studio visit. So it's nice to be able to, one advantage of Zoom is that we can get a lot of people in to see what we do. As before I finish, before I start, can I just thank Claire for all her efforts, both Claire, Mary, Pia, all in the arts office. Um, we've had a lot of toing and froing over the last while just to try and get this up and running and get things organized. So I'm very grateful for them for all, all their efforts. Um, and I'm, we're just we're going to take this talk in three sections, if that's OK. Um, we're going to talk to you a little bit about myself and Kira. We'll talk to you a little bit about uh, conservation, what it is, object conservation, and the branch of object conservation that we are involved in. We're going to give you then a virtual tour of the studio. I'm working off a, a tablet here at the moment, so we'll, we'll take the tablet around and we'll go through the different um, tools, machines, um, devices we have here that we use within our daily work. Um, we have a number of examples that we're going to go through, three in total, and we'll talk our way through them. That, that has before and after photographs on it uh, of the work, and we'll be able to give you an idea, a better idea of what we do. And then uh, we'll finish up with just um, talking about a bit about why we do conservation. And for us, what is the uh, the return and the main thing that we get out of it. It's not just about working on the objects, there's a whole range of other things involved as well. Um, so I suppose to start off, uh, to give you an introduction to conservation, uh, we are paper conservers, but we would ask you to consider if something is made or something is precious, um, if it has an art form of, of, of some sort, there's somebody out there who would be charged with repairing it, with fixing it. In the past, that, that, the, the type of people who would have involved in this would be people who would work with, within, say, the art trade, or, um, or, or people who would, be, who, who would work within a particular specialization. But if we take um, objects that are created um, and that are collected over time, you can you have items such as um, sculpture, you have, would have to say uh, oil paintings, you could have musical instruments, you could have clocks, you could have textiles. textiles. So, and people would, uh, if something goes wrong with them, somebody out there has to fix them or repair them or prevent damage from occurring in the first place. Up to around about the 1970s, uh, that was very much contained within the trade. There were some people who were working in, in institutions, but uh, who specialized within institutions, but generally it was, it was a trade um, uh, practice. From the 1970s on, it very much became part of museum practice and people who would have a specialization in say cleaning sculpture or cleaning paintings, their skill levels were increased and they became specialists within a particular area. So you have areas such as oil painting conservation, sculpture conservation, furniture conservation, paper conservation emerging. Um, both Kira and myself are paper conservers, which means we specialize in one particular area, which is 
works of art on paper. Um, we have a colleague downstairs, Kira, Kira Brennan, who is an oil paintings restorer. She specializes in oil paintings. And there's another colleague in the building, uh, Kleena Devitt, who is, uh, specializes in textiles. So that gives you a range of the, 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 the sort of divisions that are within the art, within the art section, within the section which, in which we would practice. That still lasts today. So if you, when you go and you decide to pursue conservation as a career, uh, you choose this the field of specialism. So you trade in that field. And once you're qualified, you stay in that field. So for example, if somebody came into us with uh, an historic textile, we wouldn't we wouldn't be fit to work on it. We, we would not be able to do it, but we would know where they should go um, to meet the relevant conservative for them and vice versa. So you stay in the area in which you train. We're looking because the building we work in, uh, the design tower, not only contains two other conservatives, it also contains an awful lot of other skilled specialists, such as our next door neighbour is a violin maker. We've got at least two or three practicing artists within the building. There's at least four or five other jewelers. So there's a range of skills, there's a range of uh, understanding of materials. And if as can happen in some cases, if we get a, an object that is multidisciplined or multi, there's multi material involved, we can either go to the conservatives that are within the building and they can give us a help or give us give us assistance or if need be say the violin maker next door if we need to get something made out of wood or or, or depending so we're, we're looking in terms of the, the the building we're in and the skill set that are available to us that's a rough introduction as to what we do when we, you look at paper um there's a huge range pa objects paper is used as a medium um for a huge range of different materials so even within the specialization of, um, of the area in which we are qualified, there is further specialization. And we'll go through a little bit of that at the start. We have some examples here um, already set up in front, in front of us, which we'll show you now in a second, uh, um, of different types of works, works of art on paper that we would deal with. Um, there's three different types initially, I'll show you. So I've got this swap around to this different camera and Right. Okay, I'm going to start with this one, which is uh, an ink drawing, and literally is it's a drawing by Cesar Cesar Baldacini, <laughs> and uh, it's we've picked it up ourselves because we're just interested in it. It's in really really poor condition. You can see that the bottom left hand corner is completely gone off the work, and and somebody has drawn a new crocodile. Yeah, yeah that has infilled a little bit, and there are little bits and pieces of the support gone so, all the way around. Yeah, missing. yeah, it's in really really bad shape. There's some bleeding here to the pigment. It's extremely fragile, um, and it's very acidic. Yeah. So it gives us an ethical problem here because once we remove this off its backing, this crocodile is going to go. So we're going to have to discuss between us as in how we approach that. So one option would be to keep this croco crocodile in it because you could consider it as being part of the piece now. Or we can remove it entirely, uh, leave it blank, just infill it with a similar tone piece of paper, or we can retouch it. So we'd run through the options between ourselves and come to come to a decision which best suits the object and our ethical approach to it. And um, we'll see another example of this in the examples we're going to talk to you later on. The Harry, Harry Karnoff uh, drawing is one of them. Um, we came across a very similar problem in the treatment of that, which will be uh, shown later. But this image is just literally ink on paper. Yeah. And Kira, so it's just we have a range of inks there and literally it's just a line drawn um just and that's how the artist has created that yeah. um moving on from that to this it's a drawing by william allison martin uh river conway it's got some pastel it's, it's watercolor but there are pastels in there as well and pastel basically is a dry pigment it's like chalk and kira here so will show you um, in various graphics, this is watercolor pencils. So pastel is right here, and you can see here uh, the tips of these are chalk. And if I stretch it and grab one of them for you, and, and yeah, and, yeah, just chalk. And you can see there the sort of mark it might make. It's a dry pigment. It's um, the binder on it is such that once you apply it, it sits on the surface and it creates works of this type. 
but there's also ink washes in it and um, light pastel as well. Yeah. But this is um is quite a moldy piece, and you can see down here there's a large water stain on the um, on the mount. So in this case, the mount is probably not going to make it. We'll probably remount it. Um, and we have to mold it. Yeah. That's a priority. And the third work we have here for you is watercolor. And it's a watercolor by Alicia Boyle. She her, Alicia was born in 1908, died in 1997. And it is watercolor on paper. Um, it's created in a traditional way, a piece of good quality paper is taking, taken, possibly taken out into the field. The artist sat down and um, on, on her easel with the, with the watercolor attached to it, uh, would, would use some of the materials here, uh, as you can see. Um, so a few different formats of watercolor. So you can have the solid pods or it can come in a kind of a more liquid form in a, in a, in a tube. So we would use both when, when and if we need to retouch, depending on what the object needs. But this piece has been conserved already. Mm. It was very badly damaged, uh, badly mold damaged, and it had to go through washing treatments, a number of spot bleaching treatments. So it was covered with these sort of brown marks all over it. We managed to get those out, um, repressed it, and did some minor retouching along the sea, and as far as I remember, into the, the trees in the sky as well. But the idea with the, the retouching is that you, you don't see it. These are three, we've just shown the three works of art on paper, but paper can be used in any, many, many different ways to create works. We have a piece here, which we will just to give you an example. This is a newsprint that came from the back of a frame, and we'll probably take this in a few minutes and um, we'll give it a wash. But before we do that, um, we'd just like to show you an extreme example of uh, a, a works created from paper. These are examples of papier mache. So they've been created, the images, the, 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 it's three dimensional use of paper. Um, the paper have been, has been pulped up, mixed with a, with, with a glue, and then shaped. And they've been, these are mushrooms. They're scientific examples, probably dating from uh, round about 1900s. And they would have been made as exact replicas of mushrooms um, for either instruction, anatomical, um, or sorry, to, 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 to instruct uh, people in the different ranges of mushrooms and for biology teaching and so biology lessons lessons within within uh, class so you can see that they are in something of a poor condition but they are quite beautiful um they're fantastic but um, you can see there's some structural damage here so we would need to we need to support this it's kind of unbalanced so we need to kind of support this piece back because it looks like it's quite delicately hanging on here. So we'll do that with probably um, a different form of paper. Um, and you can see some missing areas right here. So we would address those as well. We would um, fill them back in and we would, with sympathetic materials, and we would um, retouch it so you don't see this at all anymore. And everything just needs, oh yeah, so everything needs a little bit of TLC, but I looks like this one needs the most attention. Let's do more in there. I want that small little one. But as you can see, it's I, what I do like about these is apart from the novelty element of yeah. them, um, it does illustrate the huge range of use of paper and paper within. Um, these would effectively be paper sculptures. And it's not the first time that we uh, have had to deal with paper sculptures in this way. We, we've worked on a couple of Ushin Kelly's. Ushin Kelly used papier mache uh, quite extensively within his own creative process. Um, and we, um, as, as would other artists, but even from a commercial point of view, something like a, a globe um, mm -hmm. from, say, the idea, you know, we've done globes yeah. before. So globes will be bits of paper stretched around um, spheres, sort of uh, plaster, plaster spheres. So it, paper has been used quite extensively within the creative process. That brings us to the end of our introduction to conservation. Um, and we, this talk is very much billed as a, I'll come back to you, hang on. This talk is very much billed as a, um, a, 
uh, a, a, a studio visit. Sorry, here I am. This is a studio visit. So what we propose to do is just to take you from the door of the studio and we'll walk right, right the way through. So you get to see what we do, the material, the equipment, and uh, we'll talk you through some, some, some of the, uh, the, it's, it's the equipment uses as well. So we'll swap cameras around. Uh, okay, so from the front, that's what we see. Um, a couple of years ago, we had an extensive uh, lighting system put in, which makes it much easier, and uh, we can work on different sections um, and light, light up the studio as, as needed. Um, but that's, that's, this is where we would start, where, where you would enter. On our left-hand side, we have a plan chest, which contains all our materials. So materials are kept close to the door, so it's um, full of different types of paper and, and the like, sort of in terms, in terms of what we do. Um, here we have something we use quite extensively, which is our sink. It's a jacketed, um, heated sink, which has, we can uh, put water into it. It drains off on the left-hand side. Um, it's a flat base in it. It's made from stainless steel and uh, we can heat up uh, the sink and can use it for enzyme treatment if need be. With two water sources, which is just a direct outside um, uh, tap, tap, uh, uh, water source or we have deionized source as well on the right side depending on what's needed um beside this we have our drying rack um each frame is lined with blotter so if we wash something within the sink we would take it straight over lay it on the on the blotter and let it and it would it would air dry there on blotter overnight moving from there um our main benches are uh, metal frame lined with glass um we love working on glass it is yeah. uh it's just such a lovely surface to work on um you don't have to worry about cutting it you don't have to worry about marking it um it's perfectly flat um and it, you can see the object it delineates the object very very well also you can um you can work directly on the glass but if you need to see the other side of the piece you can actually go underneath um, and see it. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Pat, just to inter interrupt you there just for a sec. Kara, uh, we can't hear you quite as clearly as Pat. Okay. So maybe if just, I don't know whether you need to get to closer to the mic or use okay. your big voice. Great. Yeah, Thanks. Thanks, Claire. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, will I repeat that then? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so it, it's helpful with the, the glass bench because you can work directly on it with a piece on it. But if you need to keep your eye on the front of it, or the other side of it, you can literally go under the table and make sure, and you can still see it, it's still visible. So it adds another sort of layer of protection to the, um, the treatment that you're trying to do. Um, hope you all got that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so moving on from the, the bench, uh, we would also, the next piece of kit we would use, and we've used this quite extensively over the years, uh, is a suction table. And we're just going to pull this this around. We keep it covered at the moment. Me? Yeah, that's it there. Uh, so we connect it. There's a suction uh, compressor in here, and what the suction table does is it pulls air through from the top layer. Um, we would put uh, tissue or blotting paper down. We put an object on it, and we would then pull air through. And it gives us a degree of control, particularly if if an object is sensitive. Um, we can use moisture in a controlled way in certain areas and just uh, pull this coloration through through an object. We also have the option of putting a dome on it. So there's a dome there, if you can see it, and um, that can sit on, sit on top and uh, we can, it sits on top and we can use that um, to put humidity in on top and just especially pull through. Something is very sensitive. Especially when something is very sensitive and you have to be very careful with the application of water, the, having the dome on top of it, it will help will help um add water sensitively moving from there uh is our yeah light box yeah. and this is a very large uh light table and if we turn it on Kira's going to turn down the lights and i turn this on we just have newsprint on it at the moment uh again something that came out the back of it but it lights the back of it and it shows up damage within the image so you can see there uh, bad tear, which is it, it illuminated and illustrated a little bit better uh, by having the light at the back. The same down here. I think there's some over here as well. 
other thing it does it shows it shows us allows us to see through the paper and we can see uh, what damage is uh, what damage and you can see um, lines here where it came off which came off a uh, off the press but also it's got uh, tears and, and and we would use this we would then repair we put a piece of Japanese paper over this and hold it and repair it um, and it is quite a useful tool uh, for, for for that and, and the likes turn this off. Uh, nipping press which is a press which is used for pressing paper um, it's part of probably the final part of the process is to get the the piece of paper flat again and this is an old book press uh which i picked up oh, about 30 years ago when i started out first um and we would interleave uh, blotter and remay in between each board and then put pressure on it uh, to get the image flat again we don't use it as much as we used to we use different techniques for getting flat and ideally we would use it uh, we would try and just use boards to press something flat but on occasions uh we would we would have to use it and have to put some Something on the pressure again another bench with uh, glass on top and it's just very again very useful and again surface to work on and then tool kits tool cabinets um everything this is a um, mechanics uh, tool tool case um but it just everything is in there and organized uh, in terms of and very handy to get to get access to uh, whenever we need it um and I suppose coming around, we've got plan chest, which is fireproof and which we used for the storage of uh, works of art. Um, we put put them in this because it is fireproof, yeah. um, and that's the main main store. But also the um, the the top of it is metal, so if we have a piece that's being particularly difficult to hold flat, we can apply magnets on it on this surface, and it will hold it flat safely to, for us to be able to work on. Uh, we've. Roll storage, where so a lot of paper comes in roll in roll basis. So we have we have that above it, and we have a second light box. Um, we've been quite successful over the uh, in the last while. We would take this out and use this uh, on top of our other light box, and we do a fair bit of we've done light bleaching with it. So we would use the light um, rather than using chemical bleaching, we could use light bleaching to just reduce down staining within an object. We've also on occasion used the the window, uh, which looks out. There, we've managed to um, get objects to the window. We can, there's a way in which we can fix them to the window. And we've been, able, been quite successful at using light bleaching as well um, over the years. That's the studio. Um, that's what we do. Uh, we've, uh, hopefully that gives you a good introduction to where we are and uh, the sort of work we do and the equipment we use to do it. Um, we would hope now to talk to you about um, some examples of works that we've done, that we've undertaken over the years. And uh, to do that, I'm going to push, ah, to do that, I need to, ah, my fingers are too big. <laughs> Can you get that? No, the one, the, the arrow to the left, of it, the right, right, yeah. No? <laughs> okay, I'll put this back on. Hang on. Sorry, we're having some technical difficulties. My fingers are too big to work the... Uh, that's it, yeah. The camera uh, the front. And now we'll share screen. And you know, we're just going to talk to you about some examples of works that we have undertaken uh, over the years. Um, uh, there we are. We have three examples. Uh, we're going to talk to you today about the first is Louis Le Brocchi, um, a piece by Louis Le Brocchi called The Toyne, the Infant Cucullin, and that's a lithographic print. The second one is a, a drawing by Harry Kernoff. It's a self-portrait and the media involved in that, in that instance was charcoal and pastel, media we, we saw earlier on. And then the third piece we're going to talk to you about is a, a piece, a print by William Hogarth. It's a self-portrait with Pug, and that's a printed engraving. So without uh, further ado, Kira's going to talk to you about the first two, and then I'll come back to you and talk to you about the one at the end, or throw in my comments along the way. Kira. Throw in comments anytime. Um, can you hear me okay? Okay. Yeah. So this this piece arrived to the Paper Conservation Studio back in 2018, and just as you see there. So it was it was mounted in this frame, and you can see at the upper left edge, there's a kind of an area of orange staining. So we 
I had a look at it. It's um, it's by Louis Labrocki and it's part of the Toyn series. This one is called The Infant Cucullin. Pat, how do I move to the next image? Ah, mm -hmm. Thank you. So basically what I discovered when I took it out of the frame was that the entire corner, as you can see there, is missing. That's mold activity. So that is um, that discolored area is a large patch of mold. But basically it had activated over this um, this piece of paper for so long, it just disintegrated. Um, and the owner or the, the person who put it into the frame wanted to kind of minimize the visual impact of this damage. So they folded it over on three of the edges um, to fit it into a smaller frame. And they just put a loose piece of calico behind, behind the image. So the loss didn't, didn't jump out. Um, but basically it also arrived as a portrait frame like and portrait aspect but actually it's it's a landscape piece and it's much bigger than originally thought so i'm just going to move to the next one so that's what i found when, I, when we took it out of the frame so we had a chat between ourselves and there's there's a new, number of ways you can infill and repair missing areas um but one thing that it's virtually impossible to replicate or to retouch is white, white areas. So if there's a big stain on a white area that won't wash off or um, mostly we can minimize the visual impact of that damage with retouching as a last resort, but not with white, you will always see it. Um, so in this case, we decided the best way to, uh, to make a seamless infill um, was to pulp it. So this is a technique that, where you, you get a similar um, weight and color of paper. And um, I tore it up and I blended it in, in a blender with water. And then I, apply, um, I applied the mixture with a, a pipette over the suction table with the suction on. So the suction pulls it and it forms new paper. It forms like um, another paper matrix. So you can control how thick it is, how thin it is, um, what it looks like. There's all these various ways to mimic the original paper, but this solution was the most seamless way that we could make this infill happen. Um, there are other easier ways and there's other more normally used ways, but you would all ha always have seen it. It would have jumped out a lot more. So just from a visual perspective, this is the method we chose this time. So I'm gonna move on to the next one. This is it being carried out. It's a noisy procedure. This machine is really loud. That's on the suction table. Yeah. yeah, so from what you can see in that image is that the, the surface of the, the suction table is covered and it's covered with Melanex, which is, it's like a polyester web. And there's only a small area open at any one time. So it directs all of the force into pulling it through this one area. So it's really strong. And it's, um, it's very effective because sometimes if this piece, if the, the pigment ran in water, um, it would be a really risky thing to do this over suction. Um, but because you can focus it so much with this machine, um, it's very safe, even with media that, um, that is fugitive. So that's it after it's been infilled. It still needs to be, it needed to be flattened yet, which is now that that is the, the finished product that is when we gave it back to the um the the owner so always you will see if you look hard enough you will always see um where there is retouching and infills being made but it's to minimize the the initial vis visual -ness of the piece I just keep going to yeah, yeah, no, okay. Harry kind of. I will. <laughs> so this piece arrived uh, again. It was 2018, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah. And um, sorry, my chair is really, really noisy. It was, uh, it was put through the ringer. I mean, the piece was up in somebody's attic, and it was there for a really long time. It could have been worse but it was covered with um, dust um, and you can see the, the, the damage there. There's no glass in the frame. Yeah. And the client said, that, the, and as you can see from it, there's a large chunk of support missing. And the client said to us, Oh yeah. He, he knew it, it was in his, it was it belonged to his grandmother. Yeah. And he always remembers with that chunk missing. Mm. 
but he was it was a family heirloom and he was very interested and keen to try and have it conserved and restored if at all possible yeah. so he brought it to us and uh we Kira then took over and tried to and, and introduce the conservation process. So the first question I was asked, um, and it, it wasn't the client himself, it was his representative. They asked me if I could cut it down. <laughs> so you can see the massive missing area. They wanted to cut as a square around that. Uh, and I was just like, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to do something else. So um, we started and it was it was a it was a difficult, it was a tricky enough job, but it was really satisfying at the same time. So this is, now it's out of its frame. So it's got a giant running tear running up to beyond his hat, huge missing area um, and very discolored overall. There's some like watermarks and tide lines on it. So we got it off its backing and um, next thing, uh, yeah, we wash it. There are ways to wash pastel. There are sympathetic ways to do it. And in this case, um, the acidity level was so high, it would have been, it would have been a better idea to find a way to wash it because it really, really needed to wash some of that acidity out. So we also, as a, as a precaution and an extra layer of support, we lined it to a piece of Japanese paper. So it made the whole piece safe to hold, to handle and to carry through further work. The image itself would have been fully conserved prior to it being lined. So we would have put it on, on this, onto the suction table that you saw earlier on. We would have likely humidified it, pulled through the discoloration as much as we could, while at the same time protecting the pastel, yeah. so uh, controlling the exposure that the pastel and, and chalk were, would receive. And what that did was it reduced down the overall level of discoloration and it replaced into the paper a huge amount of strength. When, we got, when, when that strength was replaced into it, we could then use a similar suction process Mm -hmm. to line the object to uh, Japanese paper. Yeah. So then the infilling had to start. So this, you see that rectangle in the center of the, the missing area there. That is when, um, that's when you start get, trying to get the base color. So I kind of, we settled on that as yeah. the base color, but that's 15 different layers of watercolor washes to achieve that color. You can see on the bottom two pieces of paper, all the different tests that were undertaken. Yeah. So we would have taken a similar paper, sourced a similar paper, mm. but not the same color. And we would have then have um, done tests to try and bring it up to the same color as the background. Now, bear in mind two things. First of all, when this was created first, it didn't, you can see the bottom edge, you can see a faint line across the bottom edge, just below the last piece of paper. That would be blue gray. the blue gray. That would be close to the original color of the paper. Mm -hmm. So it has discolored over time, has been attacked by light, has been in, in a poor quality frame, has dust and everything added to it. And it's gone to this brown mottled color. And what we're trying to do as paper conservers is, first of all, match the type of paper and the, the surface coating and the surface finish, and then bring it to a tone that this paper wasn't intended to be originally, but where it has ended up as part of its aging process. And the tests that you see in front of us, uh, in front of me here uh, on this image, is us attempting to try and get to that point, to learn the process, to work out what we have to do to bring the paper, the, the, the infill and repair paper, to the color that of the of the, the overall background sheet. Mm. So um, after much testing, this is what we this is what we agreed on, and this was suitable as a base. And that's it in fills. Now, now we come to a different problem. Um, it's still very visually distracting. We both felt um, it's sufficient. It it holds us. It, the piece is safe now. Um, but still, it's very visually distracting and we want to, to do something with that. We've seen an example of this earlier on with the Baldini. If yeah. you remember when we were the first drawing we went to, the bottom left-hand corner was gone. And Kira mentioned that in a on occasions, we would then discuss as to what would happen next. Yeah. And this is a very good example of us trying to work out what would happen next. If we worked in a museum, we would probably leave this drawing as it currently is. Yeah. But this was owned by a client and he was, he loves his drawing. He was very enthusiastic. He wanted to, we wanted to do as good a job by the object and by the client as, as would be um, justified. So our instinct at this stage was to leave the drawing as its current state. But we did say we'll go and do some research and see if there is any, if there's anything out there that could 
help us in trying to decide what happens next? So uh, I looked online, did some online research. Harry Kernoff, I could not find any other use. I, so basically what I'm trying to say is that I wasn't willing to retouch it without a source image because um, you can see where the, the lines of the collar and the, the clothes meet, but this, essentially I've been making it up. That's not, that's, that's an ethically different situation or ethically difficult situation to be in. I was quite uncomfortable with the idea of just making up what I think should go in that area. I'd rather just have left it. So I um, started doing some more research. Um, I didn't find anything online myself, but I started getting in touch with institutions. Um, and finally, there was a researcher at NCAD? NCAD, yeah. 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 Um, so I explained the, the issue I was having to him. I sent him a, a before treatment photo um, and he kind of just got interested in it. And he just, he sourced a painting. Is the painting here? Yeah, next one. The next one. So he found this image, which it was a later painting by Kernoff. And um, you may agree with me or not, but I believe that's nearly the same figure. So that- Kernoff is, was renowned for painting himself into mm. his own paintings. He does a lot of, puts, puts himself in. And clearly this appeared to be uh, Harry Kernoff um, yeah. playing playing a piano accordion um, in, in, in a Connemara scene. So from this, I was happy to take this as the source image to work out how to retouch the pastel. So then I was happy to proceed. We were happy to go yeah. ahead at that point. So this is, a, it looks like I'm agonizing over it. <laughs> I'm not, I'm just concentrating. Uh, <laughs> so it's just, uh, I use templates and pastel. And also it wasn't just getting the lines in, you have to get the surrounding area to about the same tonal balance, basically. And that was that was kind of it at the end. Um, that's before we remounted it and- Infilled it. and partially retouched. Um, so you can see the image beginning to form through the repair that has been infilled in, into the missing area. So we're beginning to pull together um, the, the, the retouched area and reform the, the, the area of missing. Mm -hmm. There we go. That's the final image post treatment. Yeah. So this would have been mounted and returned to the owner. The, the one thing I would say about it is that we are all the time strike, trying to strike a balance between um, respect for the object and the age of the object and the way the way it should be and the way it should it, it should appear. We don't want to give them something back that looks brand spanking new. This is this yeah, is an object which is 60, 70 years old. Um, and you have to respect that. Also, this image gave us quite a bit of ethical, uh, quite a few ethical problems in trying to work out what our intervention should be and how we would. But we're happy that the resolution at the end of the time was a very good yeah. balance for the object, balance for the client and balance for ourselves in terms of as paper conservers. So often we we don't have often always, I mean, the same opinions on approach to treatment mm -hmm. and stuff. So we just shot it out. Yeah, uh, posters or the lining of posters is one which always gets us. We're always sort of constantly bantering it backwards and forwards. We just won't agree on that. Uh, within, within the uh, commercial poster, um, practice uh, there's a standard process of lining them to get them flat whereas i would be tend not to line whereas kira, kira will be I'm in favor of lining yeah, so yeah. we, we bounce that one around on, yeah. on a fairly regular basis that was the second piece this is uh framed this is the third image we're going to talk to you about today and this is an engraving which uh, we didn't show you any examples of earlier on but this is a a, a, a copy uh, of a self-portrait made by William Hogarth. It dates from around about 17, 17, 18, 17, 19. Um, the portrait is in the National Portrait Gallery in London. And this uh, is an engraved uh, image taken um, using his uh, painting as its subject matter, as its base. It's William Hogarth with Pug. And if you do an internet search, you'll see loads of versions of William Hogarth with Pug. We bought this primarily as an example of something that we could take ourselves and conserve. Um, they're relatively inexpensive, um, but they, they, uh, this was one that, that interests us, so we could use it as, for, as a given example as, as of before and after. This is a photograph of it prior to it being uh, conserved. It's literally as we received it. 
the two things of note, uh, well, sorry, three things of note, is the overall general condition of it. So it's very badly mottled, and you can see, all, particularly down the bottom edge, all that mottling. It's not so great to see there were, there were strips of discoloration running through the image. And actually, you can see uh, uh, it's possibly some areas running horizontal through his mouth. And then you possibly see another white out area uh, running through, say, the, the stomach of the dog. You see it prim primarily on the left hand side on, on, on the margins. Um, and, you'll, and there was actually a very bad fold down through the middle. Um, these you'll see now. And the other thing I would point out, two things. First of all, the image is directly against the glass within the frame. There is a gold slip around it, um, but that is there to, to hold the glass. And then the bottom left-hand corner, there was a lot of damage in the sense that the black frame was uh, was very badly damaged along the back. This is the back of the frame. And in some cases, the back of the frame can tell you as much about the condition of the object as the front. You can see it was backed off by paper. The paper's broken down. The cord used to hang it on the wall is broken. And also, there's a wooden slat backing, a pine board backing, which has begun to split. And you can see the back is very dirty, very discolored, um, and, and very, uh, very broken. When you took the paper off, you then, it then reveals the three split pine boards. And this was the standard practice in the 19th, 18th, 19th, and even into the 20th century of backing pictures off. Um, the boards themselves, the humidity, it would have been a complete single item at one stage, but the humidity acting on the back of the board caused it to split and to break open. And when we removed them, um, it revealed on the back some newsprint. And this is the newsprint we saw earlier on. Actually, we'd intended to put it into the sink and wash it, which we might, we might do it at the end. We'll do it at the end. And we can finish off with that. Um, and you can see the mark, the distinctive mark down the bottom corner. And it, it dates from this uh, 17, what was it, 18? 18, 18, sorry, 1898. So it's 1898, it's newsprint. So the, that, was, that gives us the time when the image was framed. And certainly the, the style of molding that's on, on, the, on the frame would, would suggest that it would be, uh, it dates from that period. Um, you can see as we remove the backing, you can see the white out areas and you can see this coloration to the left and right. That is caused by air pushing its way through the back um, it pushes its way between, between the gaps and its resin in the wood is passed and carried into the backing, which is, in this case is a newsprint. And that would, if that newsprint wasn't there, that would go in directly into the actual print itself. Some of it has gone through, but the newsprint has provided at least a degree of uh, protection. And uh, there's a detail of the uh, Irish Times in February the 24th, 19, or 1898. And I would intended to put this into the sink and to wash it uh, earlier on, but we'll perhaps end up with that piece going into the sink and we can show you it being washed and possibly some of the discoloration coming out of it. Um, when we removed the newsprint, that showed us that exposed the print at the very back. Um, that's the print that's underneath. And it, what, you can see from the discoloration within the newsprint that it, it did provide a barrier and it did pro provide a degree of protection for the, 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 the print that it was backed up against. Mm -hmm. Um, that's the print out of its frame. And actually it's a good shot in the sense it shows you the level of discoloration down in the bottom right-hand corner. Uh, a lot of this discoloration, the discoloration and, and that would be what we would call generally as foxing, it, comes, it came from two sources. One is the resin from the wood working its way into the actual print, discoloring it, weakening it, weakening mm -hmm. the, 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 the support material, the paper. And the other thing is it was directly up against its glass. And if in, on occasions, condensation would build up behind the glass. There was no gap between the image and the glass, so it would build up. Um, uh, high humidity would build up, particularly around the bottom edge. Um, if you put heat to that again, it causes uh, it condition, the ideal conditions for the growth of mold. And effectively, that's what's happening. Um, it's constantly temperatures going up and down, humidity being deposited on the inside of the glass, and you get that mottled effect uh, eventually. Top, top, left hand, top right hand corner, you can see some tide line as well. Sometimes the mold uh, damage isn't just kind of bits of brown. Sometimes it's like live fluff um, or mold. Yeah. yeah, yeah, like an act, active mold yeah. um, in terms of, so, yeah. and just to recap, that was the 
image as we receive this and i'm going to click stop sharing here and i'm going to change my camera around and you should be able to see in true delia smith fashion one we prepared earlier so there is the image fully conserved um as you can see i'll go in close um the mottling has gone from the bottom edge um we've treated the image um washed it, tested everything beforehand. We would have washed it. We would have um, repaired it, uh, any areas of weakness. I think it did receive a bleach, a bleach and it has cleaned, cleaned the image up hugely. Um, most importantly, we got the frame conserved as well. So the bottom left-hand corner of the frame is fully fully uh, fixed. And we've done one other thing, which uh, was sort of two things. We put a mount on a conservation board and that keeps it away from the glass. But the other thing we've done is we've interposed, it's hard to show you there, but we've swapped the gold slip that's within the frame around. So the glass is held between the black molding and the gold slip. And it gives us a space between the mount of the image and the image itself and the glass. So what that does is it puts a lot more space within the frame and that condensation problem is less likely to occur. Perhaps now at this stage, we'll, we'll, we'll just show you very quickly um, we had intended to do this earlier on, but we'll show you putting the newsprint. This newsprint came out of the back of the uh, of, of the frame. You saw it highlighted. And just to give you an example of something else, that, how we can wash this and how it would stand, uh, would, would stand washing and how the sink would, would work. Kira's going to lightly spray it. Now, bear in mind, all this has been tested beforehand, so we would test the pigment to make sure it's stable, but it's lightly humidified, and then she's going to bring it over and just lay it into the sink, and you get an idea of what it's like to see something, uh, something wash. You can see the distinctive mark still within the, within the sheet. So in this case, the... Uh... The print is safe to be immersed. So what we're actually going to do is that. Gently going to, going to allow water onto it. the surface. Often with newsprint as well, we could use uh, hotter water. Um, and we leave it in here for, what, four hours? Mm. Between four to six hours. And a lot of that discoloration, you'd see the um, the water turn sort of brown. The water will remove the discoloration from yeah. the newsprint and support, and all that brown resin will will be drawn by the water out of of the newsprint, and will effectively clean it up. That's all wet up now. So we just leave it. Often, maybe put another sheet of this is bombina. We put uh, put another sheet over it to keep the whole thing wet, and go for lunch. And what will happen then in time, as Kira said, sort of you'll begin to see a lot of this coloration begin to draw out, and uh, it will clean it will clean out and reduce down quite considerably. Yeah. It may you may start seeing it move before the end of the, uh, yeah, the questions. Yeah, that effectively brings us to the end of our examples. I, we, we wanted to conclude, though. Um, I'll just turn our camera around again. Uh, we wanted to conclude and just. Um, say a little bit about how lucky we are to do this yeah <laughs> how much we enjoy this mm -hmm. and also to give you an idea of um it's not it, it's not just about the conservation of the objects themselves it's also for us what we've found over the years is the stories behind the objects yeah. are equally as important and as valuable and they keep us very much engaged in what we do and um, to give you an example the um, uh, the mushrooms we showed you earlier on, uh, I'll pull them up again. Um, and this is just a story, uh, one, one, the mushrooms, which are all there lined up. Um, the mushrooms came to us from um, an artist called Elizabeth Prendergast. Elizabeth is a botanical artist, and she is, uh, as she said herself, nuts about mushrooms. Uh, mushrooms are quite, a, quite an amazing um, uh, vegetable and they, 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 they have extensive lives and huge variety and she is steeped in really really enthusiastic about mushrooms 
but she draws them as well as an artist. But her daughter was on honeymoon in Vienna and went into a um, antique shop and saw the mushrooms and bought them for her mother and uh, brought them home and gave them to her as a present. So it's not just about the objects themselves are really, really unique and they're, they're, they're really unusual and we get a great kick out of working them. But it's also supported and reinforced by the owner coming in and telling us that story and uh, it makes it uh, much more um, interesting, even more interesting than what, than what they cur currently are. Um, the, when Pat and I were talking about this talk, uh, the story that jumped out at me was uh, a couple of years ago. A uh, client had an appointment, so he came in um, and he appeared quite nervous um, and he said, I've got a few things to show you. So he reached into his wallet and he took out, um, it was like, it was a bunch of like folded over pieces of paper and it just, it was just, that's what it looked like. And um, he was, he was trying to explain to me that um, him, it was a very personal story, um, him and his wife had um, had a baby young and the baby was given up for adoption and he said that this piece of paper was in his wallet for 30 years and I said yeah I can I can believe you because it was almost transparent he couldn't unfold it he was he was tearing it he had tried but you could still see it was well handled so he said um, it was an amazing story that um, his other children had now become back gotten in contact with this um, this first child and they're going to go and meet and they were going out to the states and he told me they are the adoption certificates so could I do something with them and he was going the day after tomorrow as far as I know it was very urgent um, so because it was just such a such a powerful thing and such important pieces of paper I said yeah of course and for both Pat and I that, that would go to the top of our list straight away mm -hmm. um, it's an yeah. absolute priority so we got it done. Um, I did have to call him at one point because when I got it unfolded, um, turned out it was two replicas. It wasn't just one. Um, so I didn't want any sort of unpleasant surprises for him to come in with such sensitive documents. So I called him and let him know, but we got these pieces to him mounted in a way that we felt fit for benefiting the pieces that they were. And we got them to him on time before the other kids went down. Uh, that job has had its own rewards in uh, very much different ways. It's not just about the, the being able to repair the pieces of paper. No. Um, there's much more involved in that job. And there's much more emotion involved in that job. Than that. Um, the one I would mention, um, just in terms of more recent history, a uh, client came into us a couple of years ago and he brought in some pop memorabilia. But actually, what, one of the things he brought in was um, the contract that the singer Stevie Nicks signed when she was joining, when she joined Fleetwood Mac, which is back in, it was back in 1972. And it wasn't just the contract, it was actually the complete contract, seven or eight pages in, in total, which was all signed by the band. So you can see where paper um, has that emotional attachment, um, where it has, it can have that sort of um, tie to the present day. We also have been very lucky as paper conservatives we've worked with a lot of institutions over the years I've had a long um, history with the with galleries such as the Crawford Gallery in Cork or Kilmainham Jail and Kilmainham Jail has allowed us to work on some of the most sensitive Irish cultural oh, yeah. historical material um, uh, would it, that, that they would help hold within the jail mm -hmm. and it's been a quite it's been a, a privilege to do that over the years and both of us had, have had um, huge access and very uh, privileged access to that material. It's also a joy to work on an object that an artist has sat there and worked on and has tried to create that has gone down in history as being uh, um, something which is regarded as having a value within, within the Irish art circles. Or it's and, when you're working on a piece by an artist you really admire. Yeah, yeah. You can't believe your luck. I mean, that happens all the time. Yeah. It's very, it might be like a flippant thing to say that not, it, it happens all the time, but we really are very, very lucky to be able to be here and do this. Yeah. yeah. I promised Claire that we would finish at 12 o'clock. So we're at 12 o'clock now. So if anybody has questions, if you want to feed them through to Claire, we happily deal with them. Uh, well, Pat and Claire, thank you so much. It, uh, it's just been absolutely fantastic. And in a similar way to the previous um, 
to the previous studio visits that we've done, it actually ends up being so intimate that I forgot that everyone else was actually here as well. Yeah. So, Total work is it's very strange doing it from our point of view, but yeah. hopefully we got across uh, the- Yeah, and, but it is that right. lovely, uh, and it is obviously the benefits of doing it this way, that there is more of that, you know, we're right up, up close and personal. Um, so thank you so much. Um, we have a good few questions in, so I'm going to try and uh, I've tried to link a few of the questions, and I'm going to ask Moira to keep an eye on. Uh, there's great feedback, obviously, coming in, and uh, I will try and get through the questions, and I'm going to try and link the questions as well. So um, some of them are more specific to the works you spoke about. So the first question was. Um, how did you it this was with the louis Labrocke uh, piece the thawing piece how did you stop the mold spreading the mold cleanup first of all um so when you have live molds the first thing you have to do is mold clean it so that removes any live spores um it'll just prevent it from getting any worse um, the second thing you do is you add more strength into the entire piece and you do that with water so is that kind of then future proof in it as well? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it is. It just means it, um, you've, it, ha it stopped from acting any, any further. I've ta we've taken the mold spores out, but the, uh, it doesn't do anything to the discoloration. It has to be said as well with that piece. The mold had eaten away the bottom yes, left hand corner. So the yeah. entire corner on the left hand side was it's gone. gone. <laughs> yeah. So anything we did to it was an improvement. But we the, the mold was would, would be first neutralized. We would surface clean it. Yeah. And then we we would consider the next stage. One uh, possibility is to use alcohol to further reduce the mold at uh, the mold spores within within the piece of paper but those decisions will be made i think we did possibly uh, use alcohol to reduce down just to neutralize all, all the mold that's within the piece that will be a first stage and then after that we would concentrate on correcting the damage that mm. the mold has done namely first. losing the corner on the piece yeah. <laughs> yeah but in a similar way where you mentioned about the whole guard, even the placing of the like that you're kind of giving it more space that mold won't Absolutely. develop so that's what i'm saying so it's, as well as kind of conserving your kind of Yes, uh, 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 prevention. Yeah, prevention. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, next question was an extra link linking two questions here. Uh, this came in from Lorraine Whelan. Uh, she asked, "Do you give talks in art colleges? Um, as a you know, kind of where do you train all of that?" And somebody else then also asked, "Where does one train uh, the path to practice?" Um, and uh, so. I, I suppose it quite, yeah, where does one train? And I know you mentioned at the start, you were talking about specialization. And I know, Kerry, you came from like fine art background. Um, so uh, could you maybe talk a little bit about a uh, path to practice? Uh, most most um, qualification comes from training in the UK an academic qualification, which will be secured in the UK, a degree, undergraduate qualification or postgraduate qualification. Generally, it's a seven year um, training process within paper there used to be two courses in the uk it's now reduced down to one and um, the university of northumbria uh, will do an introduction to conservation and then postgrad uh, qualification within conservation most people who are practicing conservatives within ireland or paper conservatives or oil paintings conservatives, would have gone through one or two courses within the united kingdom now the other thing you need to do then after that is get some experience and there are a couple of the arts heritage or the heritage council do um postgraduate training courses within the different institutions but generally the the, the way to do it if you're interested in, in a career in conservation um would be to talk to somebody who practices within the area in which you're interested in if it was paper conserver conservation come and get in touch yeah, with us and we'll talk you through things if it's oil painting go and talk to an oil painting conserver i've always been um heartened to see people who have a knowledge about an area before they come to us and um, so read around the area look at books and um, talk to people and make sure it's an area that you're interested in and if it is then it's a question of trying to get some experience some work experience and eventually going across to the UK and doing doing a, a degree course in it. So what I did was uh, I have my first degree in fine art uh, from IADT and then I contacted Pat in 2005 and uh, he asked me to come in for a studio visit just to have a look at the place 
Um, but he told me I'd have to go abroad and study. But I, I knew that anyway. But I also, I decided on what course I wanted. And it was in Camberwell in London. And there's a specific reason that I chose this, um, specifically around the, the teaching of science, because there's a lot of chemistry based in conservation. Um, so I kind of interned here for a while, then moved to London, did my master's for two, two years, and then worked in various institutions and private studios in London. But actually, it takes a really, really long time to become sort of proficient, if you know what I mean. I trained in National Gallery back in the early 80s and came out, would, would have done a master pupil type apprenticeship to put a time in it. The course itself was sponsored by ANCO. So it really goes back to a pre um fast days and it, it we did a three-year training course in there and then i've gone on to secure a degree post-grad and then doctor qualifications from there but it, the trick is to try and get some experience from somebody yeah. and then if if you're happy with that and you can build up your hand skills you then go off and do an academic course and then come back and then try and get a job somewhere and just sorry in relating to do you give talks in art colleges i have i have done a series of lectures in ncad years ago but yeah. it, it it's bright we, we we will we will certainly if somebody has a good proposition for us we certainly will consider it uh we are enthusiasts for paper for conservation and for art practice so if it can help in any way we're happy to do so and i think with art colleges it would be quite a good a good place to go and talk about what it is that we do because it's hand in hand yeah there's a gap in art, art in in art and um, teaching yeah, there is for uh, which which and we know a lot of the skills we have Kira's a graduate uh, we also get a lot of students coming to us i my niece is a is currently in uh, in uh Dunleary. so there, there are we know that there are, there are a lot of what we do uh we could help with and also we get a lot of inquiries from practicing artists yeah. artists about how to flatten paper um, how to mount paper, how to draw on paper, how to fix and size paper. So a lot of technical questions um, come to us from artists as well on a regular basis. And actually, that's a nice lead in, actually. Uh, yeah, I have a few more questions. <laughs> for, so uh, I'm going to actually, um, actually, just while I'll, I'll ask you the next question, and I'll get back and find the other question, which uh, somebody has asked, and I know this, we were talking about this during the week, and you've hinted at it as well, that there, uh, the specialization where like oil painting doesn't stay an oil <laughs> that's what they are yeah. and uh i can't remember who you said said is the highest up the pile or uh oil painting, oil painting. So there's a hierarchy within hierarchy yeah look we, they're all colleagues and we are delighted to work with them all but because uh, oil paintings and service tend to deal with objects which are have a very high value yeah. they also have a very high regard for themselves yeah. you know so we <laughs> yeah. tend to have this practice of bursting their bubble and pulling them down to earth just uh, yeah just like it's just interprofessional yeah. you know, banter you know uh, but so they all good, all good humored anyway. they're all oh, good yeah. humored yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah yeah no we don't really believe they're egotistical arrogant and uh, yeah. and, and up their own bubs no 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 or no. nerds or nerds for that matter no, yeah yeah no, we may yeah. say it yeah. we don't believe yeah. um but they, <laughs> but at the same time Sorry, it's related to that somebody has specifically asked, where do you get paint and conserve? Now, presumably that would be related to... There is an association, representative association, um, uh, ICRI, Irish Conserver, Conserver and Restorers Institute, ICRI. If you put in ICRI and conservation into any search engines, um, that will bring you to a website. And that website has a list of practitioners, um, oil paintings conservers, paper conservers, um, uh, very similar to what we touched upon at the start, um, a division there of different art conservation practices. And, and where they're them. based as yeah. well. Yeah. Addresses and contact details. Yeah. Um, and I suppose the, the next kind of, there's kind of three linked questions. Well, they're not linked, but they are. I'm going to try and link them, which was around the materials. Uh, and I suppose uh, one of the questions was around whether, um, like say where with the pastel, where you're using a material, like how do you match that? I mean, I'll ask the three questions together. How do you match the material? If you don't like so you're matching the paper but then you have to then kind of go well you know not what brand of pastels mm. uh, and then in relation to that then um this was actually a question from pia which i'm just gonna go back and try and find uh which 
was when you stained the replacement paper with yeah. watercolor, this relates to the Harry Carnot, mm -hmm. uh, will that color age differently than the original paper? You go first. <laughs> okay, well, the, because of the watercolors I use, they're chosen for their light fastness. That's part of the reason that they've been selected. It's not just any watercolors at all. Um, so it will hold on to it. Um, however, if the owner decides to display the piece in an unhappy way for the piece, yes, it will definitely. If the light levels are too high, yeah. Um, if he puts it over radiator, whatever, if he puts it opposite the window, they yeah. will they will age at sort of different, different rates. rates. Yeah. So is um, that something then that you would kind of not keep an eye on, but would you? You would advise, yeah. Advise, yeah. but would you ever check back? Um, uh, we would. You we know would, what I mean. Like, we generally get contacted if something goes wrong. Yeah, on their side, yeah. 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 But we, we, over the past hour, we've touched on what we do. But what yeah. we do runs much deeper than this. And you get an idea about it in terms of the ethical dis mm. uh, uh, yeah. discussions we, we would have had. And um, we would be, everything we use is, is, is questioned. So we would use the highest quality retouching materials that we can get. Mm. So if we're trying to match something down, like say the color, the, the color in, in, in terms of the, uh, the infill within the Kernoff, we are using the most stable, uh, highest quality uh, watercolor yeah. that we can, we can come, come across. Bear in mind, we do have to match it down. So we have to, we have to, we just, we're aiming towards them. But at the same time, we would, we, the principles that we work towards are generally reversibility. Anything we do to an object, we would like to be able to see that it is reversed easily, working on the basis that somebody's going to come at this object again in the future. If it lasts another 100 years, there's a chance. Within Japanese paper conservation, uh, there is a tradition of every hundred years they will come and they will repair a scroll. So the scrolls will be scrolls will be repaired. So if you have a four hundred year old scroll, three people have been at that scroll to fix it and repair it over that period. So there's a recognition that somebody will come. To, so you, you, the methods they use are methods which are fully fully reversible. We would also have had extensive experience on advising people environment. We've all both of us worked in museums. So there is a set, set of criteria for the display of objects within museums, but we would filter that down for advice, into advice that we would give clients who collect objects from us and bring them home or put, or put them on display at home. Yeah. We, we have a balance, when I say balance, the owner of that piece loved the piece. He was delighted with it at the end of the time, the Karnoff particularly. He, he put it back into a frame. He wants to put it on his wall. He wants to enjoy it. At the same time, we would advise him that if he puts it in too strong a light or if he puts it in daylight, yeah. something will happen with it in time. But, but just we will make them aware. Yeah. 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 No, always. Yeah. Actually, just, uh, once again, sorry to come back with the question actually around the art college. I, uh, I misunderstood it. It was actually around whether you advise uh, our, uh, our students on using stable materials was actually the, 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 the question there. But I'm actually going to link that in with uh, Tonda Tote has a question. Um, what do you think about the possibilities of conserving handmade papers? Uh, papers that are made from a mixture of plant fibers, cotton, bamboo, abaca, etc. Et uh, I presume the suction table would work for rebuilding with pulp, but the exact plant pulp would need to be recreated, just out of yeah. curiosity. Just bring, bring it in. Yeah. Some advice. We've, <laughs> all paper is made from plant. Yep. That's yeah. the first thing I would say. Most paper, paper up to prior to uh, say the 18, 1870s uh, would have been primarily made from cotton. Rags which are beaten up and they were made from, made by hand. So they're literally lifted out of a, a vat of water. Not only, unlike the, the sink we have, lifted out of the vat of water and the fibres would be on it and that would be dried. After the 1870s, um, people began to use wood pulp. So, and that's most paper you look at today, it's, 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 it's made from wood. Now you can use other plants. Newsprint would be, would be very, very, so no. uh, all papers made, they're just particular fibers which you would make paper from or in some cases what people do is they have a base of cotton and they would add fibers to it uh question related to that as well which is what kind of uh, this from laura kelly what kind of japanese paper do you use to back the repaired works yeah uh, we have a bunkoshi we, we have a, a commercial paper now roll which we buy in which is of medium weight 
um, it is probably um, it's a gamble fiber and it is made in a commercial uh, way through. We also supplement that with a huge range of yeah, handmade Japanese papers. There's a few places in London that uh, um, it's a place without in non pandemic times that I go a lot. Um, so there's a place, there's a couple of places. Shepherds, there. Shepherds is one of them, which is retails and sells paper. Japan house. Yeah. Um, there's a good few shops that you can like literally just bring sheets home with you. Yeah. Uh, but we have a massive array of Japanese yeah. paper. I mean, the the role of the the, the bunkoshi is just for large, it just for large scale line ends. Um, it's always there when we need it. I mean, it's absolutely invaluable, but we do have the whole range. It's chosen because of its weight. Uh, it's a mid-range paper. Um, yeah. And because of its fiber, it's long fibers, and it is very, very stable. Um, but depending on the object we're lining, if there was something that was very, very flimsy or light, we also have a range of, of, of lighter papers, which we would choose and use in that case. Yeah, it's all the, the treatment depends on the object. It's not yeah. a standard... It's not a standard um, solutions that we would just go yeah, across the yeah. board and address each piece separately. Yeah, that's, yeah I don't, you don't just take it off the shelf. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> Option A, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, cash and wrap if you want to take it to the... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> click and collect. Um, the, uh, this, I'm trying to find a second question here, Moira, you might assist here. Uh, a question came in from Brian Fay. Um, there was also a question around how long did the hurry turn up take to restore, but I'm, I'm going to ask that, but I'm also going to, because I'm conscious of time, um, uh, the, there's a, the question from Brian Fay is, have you had ethical issues with a piece that a client might want, but you were uneasy with, and I'm not sure what... Yes, we have, we have, and in that case, um, we don't work on it. Uh, there was a query there, Claire, from, I think it might be Melissa, is it? Um, or Madeline, just had they ever refused a request? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> and we we'll, we'll, need to do so. Yeah, we can do We reserve the right to say no to a client. Yeah. As Kira said a few minutes ago, uh, when she was presenting the Karnoff, um, uh, the agent of the client came to us and said, uh, could we yeah. cut it down? So you, that's the one you get on a regular basis. Could you cut it down? Just cut that bad bit out. And we, we put the rest of it into a frame. And you go, no. Yeah, yeah. We're not in the business of cutting down paper. We're in the business of conserving paper. Um, sometimes sometimes it's, it can be a, a personality thing between you and a client that it doesn't work out. But then a lot of times client wants you to do something that you it's just you're not happy doing. Yeah. Um, particularly when you know that you can fix it and bring it back to a, a better condition. But when you talk to them about, say, what it's going to cost, they go, oh, no, no, I'm not interested, mm. whatever. Um, in that instance, no, you wouldn't, you wouldn't uh, facilitate them. Yeah, because yeah, I, I know you, you, you mentioned that, they, like, even in one of the pieces you were saying, the museum would go that far, but a private yeah. client might go. That's so, that's, really so each, yeah. as you said, Kerry, each conversation is... Um, and, uh, Quite unique, yeah. Which, yeah. So yeah. You, have refu you have refused, though... Uh, Definitely. Uh, conservators untold stories uh i think yeah. we have a series in this because we'll be all checking in next week to see how that piece is going the one you put in the suction table yeah. so we'll all join you this time next week yeah. <laughs> just from the time, i'm just going to finish on the speaking of timing just a, an approximation of how long did the hurry turn off like what's the length of that process well when whenever we work on any object we never work from start to finish on that object because you have to factor in things like waiting times or drying times, which can take days. Yeah. So Pat and I will always be working on, let's say 10, between six to 10 projects at any one time. Yeah. yeah. So we have to leave the current off for a little while. We move on to something else. Sure. Um, Pat has his own projects. I have my own projects. So we'd be working, we would, we'd have a number of things going through at yeah. any one time. But um, the, that one was particularly difficult in the sense that it took quite concentrated amounts of time. Um, yeah. and obviously then the research then it, I'm going to say eight weeks oh really I actually would sorry I thought you were going to say like eight months or something yeah no it'd be a no, bit it was here for a while yeah, yeah. <laughs> we started but once we started looking at it carefully or closely and, and beginning treatment I think it went from basically yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah from start to finish yeah okay. um I'm just scanning there I think I'm kind of hoping that I've covered all of the questions um i'm sure we could continue for another while but uh 
I just like to say Pat and Kerry. But before you go, can we show you um, the, the the piece we'll throw Let's on the front camera and we can show you uh, the newsprint in the sink washing. Oh, brilliant, see, yeah. Great. Way to end. Uh, uh, there you can see it. Roll. Um, there's a little discoloration. Yeah, there's some discoloration going over. Is that a good morning's work for you then? Like, uh, <laughs> well, this has been talking to you a lot, you know. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. you know where he takes eight weeks, like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, that 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 could sit there. I mean, that's just the back, but that could sit there for about uh, for four four hours. Just uh, we take that out. We would redo that again. Yeah. Um, if that was a work of art, we couldn't leave that level of discoloration. Yeah. You know, we'd have oh, to take yeah. it to a next phase, which is taking out the discoloration. But it just it gives you an idea of. Uh, of, of what what what's involved in terms of the, the treatment of it. just it's handy to yeah. uh, like uh, okay. no. well, uh thank you so much again and I know there's yeah. like uh, a mutual appreciation coming in uh from uh, the audience uh I just like to uh, and uh, I, I'm just so delighted that after uh, nearly a year of in conversation with you Pat, yeah. <laughs> there. Uh, so uh, it's great and uh I'd just like to thank everyone for coming along this morning as well and uh, as I said the, the appreciation is overflowing in the chat so uh thank you so much again and um yeah thanks to everyone for coming this morning so we'll leave you all now. Thanks, bye. <laughs>